when the crisis is over. When the crisis is over. A crisis is a situation that has reached a critical phase. For example, COVID-19 could be considered a crisis because of the devastating effects that it has had around the world. But because of world history, we understand that this too, COVID-19, is going to soon be over. That is because of world's history. There is nothing that has come into the world that has been catastrophic, chaotic, critical, that God in his time has not caused has not caused it to run its course. God is going to cause this to run its course. Do I have a witness? So then, when this crisis is over, people need to ask the question, could God really be real? Is this place called hell real? Because going through this crisis, COVID-19 have allowed me to see that I am not going to live upon this earth all of my life. Amen. So when this pandemic, COVID-19, coronavirus, has ran its course, where will I be? What kind of decisions will I have made? Because I understand because of this crisis, I saw many people, some good, some bad, some not so good, some not so bad. I saw them pass away. So when this thing is all over, this pandemic is all over, what kind of decisions will I have made toward God? Because I can see through this pandemic that I'm not going to be up on this earth always and so there are some decisions that I'm going to have to make. When this crisis is over, what kind of decisions will you have made? What will you have done? Is anybody listening to me? Now, if you live long enough, sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with your own personal crisis. Yes, yes. But I want you to understand one thing, that all crises are not fatal. Mm -hmm. Now I have witnessed for myself being a pastor. I have witnessed that when some people have gone through critical times and critical events, some people that didn't know God got to know God because of what they went through. And I have witnessed that some people that already know God, when they went through critical events and traumatic circumstances and situations, they grew closer to God. Now, it's very unfortunate that it takes critical affairs, critical events, for people to get to know that God is real and hell is a real place. Is anybody listening to me? I have seen people as a pastor. People that didn't want to have anything to do with God. Wouldn't go to church. Even talked about people that talked about church and mentioned the name of Jesus. But they went through something so traumatic. So critical. It had reached a critical phase and they turned their lives over to the Lord. And there have been some people that were straddling the fence, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah, yeah. And they went through something that was beyond <laughs> that control. Yeah, yeah. In other words, it was not something that they just readily went and got into, but it was something that came upon them 
that they had no control over and they turned around and grew closer to God. But how come we have to go through things like this before we turn our lives over to God and, and, and start doing the things as a Christian as we should be doing? Straddling the fence. Honey, let me tell you something. That God is real. Yes, he is. The Bible says yes, every tongue shall yes, confess yes, yes, yes. that the Lord yes. is God. Yes. The name of Jesus is above every name in heaven. Thank you. Above every name upon the earth. Mm. And above every name beneath in hell. Ooh. So we are going to have to give an account yes, to this God. Do I have a witness, anyone? Yes, yes. Now when we Take into account biblical history and examine the lives of Old Testament saints. Mm -hmm. And King David comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And King David, you know, he found himself in many critical situations, many trying times. But when we look close enough at the life of David, there was two things that he did in order to bring himself through the traumatic and trying situations that we call crisis. Mm -hmm. Number one, David believed in God yes, yes. with all of his heart, mm -hmm. mind, soul, and strength. Mm -hmm. He loved God with all of his mind, all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his strength. And this is why God said, this is a man after my own heart. Number two, David, what David did, David spoke words from his own mouth regarding the things of God. Number one, how David got through his crisis was he believed in God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And number two, he spoke words from his mouth. And Many of the words that David spoke from his mouth, we find in the book of Psalms. And I'm going to read some of them to you. Let me recap what I'm saying. That David was a man that found himself in many critical situations. As a matter of fact, King Saul was trying to take his life. David was in many battles. He came up against enemies that were much stronger than him. As a matter of fact, David was in a battle and he was almost killed. But one of his men came and, 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 and saved his life. So he was caught up in many critical situations. But there were some things that he did. And I want you to listen to me. He loved God. Does anybody here love God? Yes. See, if you love God, it's going to be reciprocal. God is going to show his love toward you. As a matter of fact, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So God has already shown you that he loves you. Amen. So David, number one, he, he loved God. And number two, he spoke words that brought God on the scene. And did you not know that you could articulate words that were literally Bring God on the scene to call deliverance to come unto you. Now here is what some things that David said. I just wrote down just a few. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. The Lord is my refuge and my strength, my very present help in the time of trouble. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. And when the Lord is the strength of my life, and when shall I be afraid? The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my high tower. Like I said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The Lord teacheth my hands to walk. 
In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard my cry. These are just a few of the words that I took from the book of Psalms just to speak them to you so that you can see when David spoke words, God came to his rep, his uh, rescue. He's my refuge and my strength, my very present help in trouble. So what am I saying? I am saying that the word of God attracts God's attention. So sooner or later, if you live long enough, you're going to endure your own personal crisis. But what do you do? Now I'm talking to believers. What do you do? What do you do when things have gotten out of control? When things have gotten beyond your hand to fix? What do you do? Now you say that you love God. But you need to have some word in you. And you remember I talked last week about uh, living by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God? So when you make up your mind to do that, you're going to get some of God's word in you, and you're going to begin to articulate it, or speak it, or confess it. And when you're confessing God's word, it literally brings God on the scene. Yes, and I want to tell somebody that there is not a crisis that is larger than God. All right. There is no problem that you have gone through that God can I get you out of it? Yeah. Because he's my refuge and my strength. Right. He's my very trouble. Help in the time of trouble. The Lord is my rock. Yes. The Lord is my salvation. Yes. The Lord is my high tower. Yes. Yea, though yes. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall feel no evil. When I call him, he will answer. Yes. He orders my steps. Yes. Yes. So when I'm speaking God's word, now if I can say this, now if I can say this, God sitting on his throne. And here his child is articulating God's word that God has been, has allowed to be written on the pages of the Bible. God will lean over, and if I can say this now, and he will say something like this, that sounds like me. Because he and his words are inseparable. That sounds like me. So I got to go and see who this is calling my name. And if I can say this now, when he arrives, he find you in a critical situation, but because you have called him, he has heard you. Don't you understand that God has to deliver you because the crisis is not larger than God. The thing is, we have made it. the crisis larger than God. Some of our problems we make larger than God. When you don't have any faith, your problem becomes larger than God. When you are walking in fear, your problem becomes larger than God. When you don't believe that God come, will come to help you, your problem becomes larger than God. But why are you in the midst of the trouble? Did you not know that God is standing right there in the midst of the trouble? Waiting for you to say and do the right thing. But when the crisis is over, when David crisis, Ray was over. He did not forget about his God. That's right. That's right. Now let me let me tell you something here, brother of God. David was not by any means perfect. None of us here are perfect. Your sins, your shortcomings, everything has been paid for. See the difference between David and and those men that were probably serving David. Well, David believed in God because God acknowledged the fact that he was a man after my own heart. So when David's crisis was over, he did not forget about God. i get there in just a minute, y'all. i get there in just a minute. When my crisis in San Diego was over, when God took the time, to come to me and share with me a dream that some men had plotted to take my life. 
And God gave me a dream and showed me what they was planning and showed me what I needed to do. And when they came, I implemented God's plan and I saved my life. But when that crisis was over, I forgot about God. Now, I wasn't saved then. And God took that into consideration. See, but look at him. The Bible said that if any man be in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Yes, yes, old yes. things have passed away, and old things, uh, new, uh, old things have passed away, and old, all things have become new. Right. So God expects mm -hmm. something different out of you and I. Mm -hmm. yes. God expects us to show our appreciation when He delivered us out of a crisis that had the that was going to take your life. If mm -hmm. I can say that, mm -hmm. God expects something different out of yes, you. He is. How much is given? Much is required. Much is required. See, if you're on a job, they're paying you a lot of money. They require more out of you than somebody that's just on the on the Lord's holy pole. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying? When you get paid a lot of money, they require a lot out of you. If you don't believe me, ask some NFL coaches. Y'all know what I'm saying. And when the NFL coach is not winning the game, they paying him a lot of money, he's going to get fired. So God is expecting a lot more out of us. And see, we might think that God don't expect anything out of us. Wait a minute. What makes you think that God has not expected anything out of you when he has uh, called his son to give his own, he gave his, his son gave his life for us. Right. And you don't think that God is expecting anything out of you? Right. Yes, right. he is. But when I was unsaved in that situation, God saved my life because God saw me down the road giving my life to him. Amen. And I can look back at that as a testimony. Mm -hmm. But I can say that when that crisis was over, when that crisis was over, I forgot about God. Mm -hmm. Now listen to me. When you go through a crisis, it doesn't mean that you're going to stay with God. Mm -hmm. Even though it could have been the crisis that drew you to God. Yes. But when the crisis is, is all over, you run on back mm -hmm. to your messy life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when the crisis is over. Yeah. Yes, I did. Has God ever got anybody out of trouble in here? Yeah. And, and when everything gets back to normal. You know, when, 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 you were, when, you were, when you were looking for a job, if I can say that, okay. when you didn't have any money, mm -hmm. and how, how, you would, how you would do a little fast, how you would do a little bit more praying, mm -hmm. how you would do a little more seeking the face of God, and when God finally gave you this job, paying you all of this money, and all of a sudden now you don't forgot about God, and your head is straight up in the air because you think you're this and all of that now. You have forgotten about God because the crisis of being broke is over. Right. <laughs> when the crisis is over, what do you do? Most of us can testify to the fact that when our crisis was over, we went right back to our messy ways. Being nasty. Being short. Halfway going to church. I mean, I mean, just, 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 just oh, Lord. wouldn't do things right. But while you were in the crisis, when, when you didn't have anything, wanting to get a house, but you couldn't get one. Wanting to get married, but you couldn't find a husband, you couldn't find a wife, or whatever. But you spent all that time praying, and when God finally came through and gave you that what you had been praying for years for, now that the crisis is over, you have forgotten. See, but we need to take a page out of David's book. When the crisis was over, he did not forget about God. When crisis is over, people stop coming to church. They start reading the Bible. They stop praying. They stop doing the thing that is necessary to keep them growing strong in the Lord. They go right back to the old messy ways. Now, 
Why would a person stop hearing the word of God? Did you not know that the word of God is necessary? And like I said last week, you know, man of the spirit, you have to totally live on a physical body, what have you. And Jesus was telling the devil, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So the word of God is necessary. But one thing, when a person goes back to their messy ways, they get out of church. And when you are not hearing the word of God on a consistent basis, guess what? You're going to backslide. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And when you try to tell someone that they're not living the way that they used to live, yes. Yes. when you try to tell them that they're in a backslidden state, you know, I would like to give somebody some advice. It would probably be better for you not to tell somebody that they are not living the way that they used to live. Right. Right. It would be better for you not to tell anybody that they are in a backslidden state. It would be better because, guess what? You're going to get a mouth full. <laughs> Because the truth hurts. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants you telling them that they're in a backslidden state. Right, right. Nobody wants you telling them that they're not living the way that they used to live. Right, right. See, they have gotten that way because when God delivered them out of that trouble that they were in, they turned around and forgot about God. Now, if you look careful and close enough, you will find that God has done some good things for you. God has given you a new home, given you a new car. God has given you the money that you need. God has healed your body. God has given you children. God has given you a husband. God has given you a wife. But when God has did his very best for you, you turn around and forget about God. Drive a new car, but you won't let nobody get in. <laughs> Got money in your pocket, but won't even buy a coat for somebody that you see and know need a coat. Won't even buy somebody a loaf of bread. See, you living high now. See, but once upon a time, you were so happy when somebody gave you a loaf of bread and a slice of bologna and what have you. You were happy because you were... See, but the crisis now, you're over. Break it down, Pastor. Break it down. But you look at everybody and say, I wonder how they should be doing that. Why, do you, why, why are they in a situation like that? See, first of all, that, that's not a question that you should be asking. Amen. See, how would you felt when you, if you had heard somebody say, well, I wonder why are they living like that? Why are they living in that little uh, nasty house? Why are, they, why are they driving that piece of car or whatever? Would you like for somebody to be asking a question like that? See, first of all, if you're not going to help them, keep your mouth shut. Amen. 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 <laughs> I've been in a situation where I was glad somebody gave me a coat. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Omaha, you know, I came from California. It didn't get cold in California, it barely rained. Mm -hmm. And here I am, I mean, like, you know, I didn't do no study. You know, so the high weather in, 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 in Nebraska, you know, somebody had said it was cold in the snow. But see, but, but all of that stuff didn't dawn on me until I got here. Right, right. <laughs> you know, when we, when we, uh, we're driving, riding on the bus, you know, the coast and coast we got to Nebraska, we started seeing snow <laughs> on the ground. Because like from, from California, you know, coming across the states and getting to Nebraska and what have you, you know, started getting cold. And I'm looking at the snow on the ground and what have you, and I'm looking, I don't have a coat. I got us little high heel shoes or what have you. <laughs> now, what am I going to do? Didn't have any money in my pocket, none whatsoever. See, I was in a crisis. Right. Now, I'm going to tell you something that a, a little boy said. They were on their way to Omaha, too. He and his mother and his sister. And I guess he noticed the shoes that I had on. Now, if you, if you can remember, shoes that we wore last back to your platform. That's what I'm talking about. Play that in the high heels, yeah. what have you. And said, I had a pair of those on. <laughs> And the little boy, being about 10 years old, he said something to his mother very interesting about me. And I overheard it. And he said, Mama, that man ain't gonna fall on that ice. <laughs> and you got to understand now, I'm from California. Right, right. And I said to myself, what ice is this boy talking about? I'm not gonna go and skate. What are you talking about? And so, oh, it didn't take me very long to figure out what right, he was talking right. about. And see, when I, when, I, when, I, when we got to the bus station, you know, the dad shoveled the best that they could or whatever. And, and you know, I get one of those, you know, 
almost fell. And it dawned on me about a day later what that little boy meant. Those heels that I had was going to cause me to fall on that ice. But now, through it all, through that crisis, coming to a city where I didn't know anybody, 800,000 people in the city of Omaha. I knew very few people. But through it all, God got me through that crisis. And when I finally gave my life to God in April of 1980, and I came here in February of 1980, when I gave my life to God, and when I began to take notice of the little miracles that began to happen, no, some of them wasn't, wasn't all lost. He wasn't actually speaking the Red Sea. He wasn't saving me from the mouth of a lion or whatever. But it was large enough for me to start taking notice of it. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where I said that I'm, going, I'm not going to go back to my messy ways because here is somebody that loved me. God was showing his love to me because I had not that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So when that crisis was over, when that crisis was over, I started to look at other people when I would see them in a situation. I wouldn't look at them and say, hmm, I got something. You should be getting something too. You should have something. I didn't look at them like that. Because everybody is going to go through something. Sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with your own crisis. But when the crisis is over, what do you do? Do you go back to your messy ways? No. Now, I can remember, this has been about uh, five, six, seven years ago. I was called to the hospital. And I believe in laying hands on the sick that they might recover. Because the word of God says, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall you know, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So I believe in laying hands on the sick. So I was called to the hospital, and the young man that I went to pray for, I didn't really know him, but I knew his family. And uh, he had been in an accident, a bad accident, the night before, and uh, they called me. And I went out to the hospital because of the family. I didn't know the young man. And when I got to the hospital, they met me, and uh, they took me to the room of the young man. And I looked at him in the bed, and I said to myself, you know, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, he ain't going to make it. I mean, you know, like, these are thoughts running through my head. You know, but I don't give voice to what I think. All right, man. All right. Now, the doctor was in the room also, and the young man's father. And I could overhear what the doctor was saying to the, to the father. He was telling the father, if he recovers, it's going to be a long road to recovery. And he's going to have some physical ailments if he recovers. And I could see the father, tears running down his eyes. He was crying because I'm standing there and I'm looking at the, 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 the young man in the bed, all swollen, I mean, tears running through his body from head to feet. And when the doctor left, the father was crying. And I asked the father, I said, would you permit me to pray for your son? He said, that's why we call you out here, Pastor Reese. I want you to pray for him. So I went and laid my hands on him. And I prayed the prayer of faith. Didn't get loud. Didn't attract any attention. I just prayed the prayer of faith. For the Bible says the effectual favor of prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You calling yourself righteous? No, Jesus did. Amen. Jesus did. Yes, he did. I became righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Everybody, if you've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're righteous. So the effectual favor of prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So after I prayed, I left. I bid the family, you know, good well, you know, take care. And uh, about seven days later, eight days later, I see the young man at church. 
You know what I'm saying to myself? You know, like, wow, you know, because I didn't recognize it because, you know, like, the sweating had gone down. Because I told you, he was in the bed all swollen up. I mean, that chills all over his body. And, and when he came to church, he had, a, he had a, a brace around his neck and one crutch. That's all he had. That was the first Sunday. And then the next Sunday, I told you that the first Sunday was seven days that passed. But they said, long road to recovery. Long road. And if he recovers, some physical ailments. So the next Sunday, the brace was gone, the crutch was gone, and what have you. So he was coming to church. Everybody was happy. Everybody was happy. Everybody was happy. As a matter of fact, he brought his girlfriend to church the following Sunday. Next time he brought his uncle to church. Next time he brought his aunt to church. I mean, he brought a whole bunch of people to church because they saw him in the hospital and they saw what God had done. They saw the miracle that God had done. And I noticed after about two months, I didn't see the young man because they've been, been in church every Sunday for the past two months. And we've been listening in, intently. I mean, be on the edge of the seat looking at me, mm -hmm. listening to what I'm saying. I was encouraging him. I said, you know, I said, God bless you. And I said, don't forget it now. So, after about two months of going to church on a consistent basis, I saw him miss the sun. And then he came back the following Sunday. And after that, I didn't see him no more. I haven't seen him since. We're talking about five, six, seven years. So what am I talking about? What am I talking about? When the crisis of death has passed, when the crisis is over, what do you do? See, sometimes it takes a crisis to draw a person to God. Yeah, yeah. But just because you have gone through a crisis don't mean that you're going to stay with God. Yeah. And far too often, when the crisis is past, when the crisis is over, what do you do? What do you do? I mean, now, he knew, the family knew, that God had done something for him. And now, I want to show you how appreciative the father was. Now, at that time, we had about uh, 40 people coming to church, consistent on the Sunday, between 30, 40 people, you know, give a few, take a few on Sunday. And the father came to my office, you know, right after the Lord had, had did the miracle with his son, because it was a miracle. And he said, well, Pastor Reese, I want to do something for the church. And I mean, back in the chair. I said, what do you want to do for the church? Because it was right around Thanksgiving. He said, I'm going to invite everybody to church to Turkey. He said, can I do that? I said, you most certainly can. And so the, the Sunday leading up to Thanksgiving, he drove a truck. And on the back of the truck, it was full of turkeys. <coughs> and I told everybody, the turkey is out of the truck. So he, was, he showed his appreciation because he knew that had it not been for the power, the mercy, and the love of God, his son would have passed. He knew it. The family knew it. But when the crisis had passed, he, not to say that, went back to his old ways. Went back. That's what happened in many instances. When God steps in, when God delivers one, when God meets the financial need, when God heals your body, mm. when God do something for you that you have been praying for for a long time, mm. and when God finally steps in and do it, you forget about mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. Is anybody praying with me here? Mm -hmm. Now, let's turn to John. I want to show you something out of the book of John. John the fifth chapter. John five, and he was a man that was had a disease. He had this disease for thirty-eight years. Would you consider that to be a crisis? Yes. Now he had had this disease for thirty-eight years, and now how this situation was, I, I'm really not sure. But the Bible says that that was a pool. 
where the angel came, you know, once a year in trouble of the water, and anybody that stepped off into the pool, they were healed of their disease. Mm -hmm. So let's read this here. I want to start with the first verse. I'm going to read nine of these verses. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, weathered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So it says, a certain season the angel will come and trouble the water. I said once a year, it didn't say once a year, it said, you know, a season. So the angel went down and troubled the water exactly what troubling the water mean, I don't know. But anyway, he did something to the water that if anybody stepped in, it would heal of their infirmity or their disease. Now, the fifth verse. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When he saw him, when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? And Jesus asked him a question, Do you want to be made well? Okay, the impotent man, according to the seventh verse, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I am coming, another step is down before me. So Jesus asked the man the question, Do you want to be well? And he gave Jesus this excuse. Well, when the angel troubled the water, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. Now, you know that after the angel has troubled the water, that if anybody steps into the water, they're going to be made whole. I will have somebody to throw me in that pool. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I've been sick for 38 years, and the only excuse that I have is I don't have nobody to put me in the pool. Right, right. Poor old me. Right, right. Poor old me. I don't have nobody to help me, Jesus. Jesus asked him, Will thou be made whole? And the excuse is, I don't have nobody, Lord, to put me in the pool. So because I don't have nobody to put me in the pool, I'm going to be like this. He was in a critical situation. That was a crisis. And that's all you got to say. I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. Right. Pitiful. 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 Right. And that's how many of God's people are. Yes. We come up with these flimsy excuses. excuses. Yes. Notice yes. In the eighth verse. And Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the seventh. Now, had it not been for Jesus, he, he would have remained in that critical state. But Jesus told him, without touching him, Pick up your bed, and walk. So he was made whole of it. He was made whole, but guess what? He went about his own business after that. Now let's read the 14th verse of that same chapter, chapter five. Let's go down to the 14th verse. Now he had got healed, walking, having a great time and what have you, but notice in the 14th verse, afterwards, Jesus find him in the temple and said unto him, behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. In other words, don't forget what God has done for you. You were in a critical situation. You have been ill for 38 long years. And you know that a miracle has taken place in your body. As a matter of fact, you was here at the pool, wanting somebody to throw you in the pool, but no one accommodated you, and I was here, and I said, will you be made whole? And you said, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. But Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. So he was healed without even getting in the pool. So he went to the temple having a good time. He was walking out, having a good time. And Jesus found him in the temple, and Jesus said, if I can paraphrase, I see you having a good time now. 
But please, don't forget what God has done to you. Right. And please don't sin no more unless something worse comes upon you. So what I'm saying is that when the crisis is over, don't you forget God. Amen. Did you not know that it's costly? Yes, it is. To forget God? Yes, it is. It's costly yes, to forget God. Yes. Now, do any of you ever think, I have ever thought, so I wonder, you know, that like, do Pastor Reese ever think about staying at home some Sunday mornings? I mean, it got to come through your mind every once, every once in a while. You don't have to raise your hand. I don't have to you know, like, get up there on Sunday preaching sometime, you know, that Bible. Is, you know, does the Pastor Reese ever think about staying at home? Can I be honest? The thought come to my mind. See, but you have to understand that I know where the thought is coming from. The thought is either my thought, God's thought, of the thought of the enemy. So since I know the responsibility that I have, I can't implement that thought which said you ought to get back in the bed and, you know, call somebody and let them go to preach. I can't do that. God has been too good to me. Because I understand that how can they heal except they have a preacher? And how can a preacher preach except they have been sent? So I have been sent to preach the gospel irregardless to how many people are here. It's my responsibility. So I can't neglect the things that God has called me into. Because things certainly have gotten better. The crisis is certainly, certainly over, but I can't get, forget about how far mm -hmm. God right. has brought. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. And so, back to the man. 38 years being sick. Flip the excuse. I don't have nobody to put me in the pool. I would have gotten to the edge of the pool and I would have rolled over in the pool. I was going to drown. I was walking out of there. Did you listen to me? I mean, being in that, that, that weakened state for 38 years, and that's what, no, I'm getting to the pool because I know that the angel coming, and when the angel stirred the water, I'm falling in there. I'm either going to drown, or I'm coming out of there. But Jesus had mercy upon him. And when the man got well, he went to the temple, and Jesus found him. And if I can paraphrase and say that Jesus said, I see you well now. Don't forget what God has done to you. Mm -hmm. I've done for you. Because if you do, start back to sin. Something worse mm -hmm. is going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, when the crisis is over, what do you do? COVID-19 is going to soon be over. How soon? I don't know. The reason why I say it's going to be over is because of world's history. All you got to do is read world history. All those plagues that is written that kill a lot of people and what have you. Eventually, there was an antidote. There was a vaccine that came along and eradicated the pandemic. See, but the fact of the matter is when this pandemic is over, in this contemporary age, in this modern age that we live, people ought to be thinking about, man, could Heaven be real. All right. Amen. Could hell be real? Yes, indeed. I need to rethink my situation. Okay. Amen. Because 15 years ago, nobody could have told you right. that a pandemic to this magnitude will attack this modern world in which we live. Okay. Amen. And it seemed to be prolonged and extended. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Help is on the way. Amen. But the question is, when it's over, right. what kind of decisions Amen. will you have made? Yeah. Now, one more person, I'm going to pull this. Now, as a matter of fact, let me read it for you. It's found in John 8th chapter. You got people afraid, people don't want to leave the house. Uh, talking about, you know, I'm, I'm going to die from this disease. Where's your faith now? Johnny, start with the third verse. 
and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him Jesus, a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. They were living according to the law. They were not living according to the faith. Here, I'm according to the law. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law, in, in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say thou? Or what do you say? This they say tempted him, that they might have, a, have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his fingers wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So this lady, she was a in a crisis because they meant to take her life. See, but Jesus was there, and Jesus was here to move the people from the Old Testament to the New Testament because they were living according to the law. But we were going to live in the church age. We live in the church age by faith and grace. So they said, you know, Jesus... This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. You know, Moses said that somebody that's caught doing this should be stoned. Now, what do you say? Jesus took his time before he answered. He, was, he stooped over, riding on the ground like he didn't even hear them. But when they kept pushing him, he finally said, okay, those of you that are out there without sin, let him cast the first stone at him. All of them had seen it. So nobody was able to cast a stone at her, and all of them left. And Jesus asked the lady, he said, now where are those that accused you? And Jesus said, there are not. And Jesus said, I don't accuse you either, but go in peace, but don't see it no more. She was in a critical situation. But Jesus said, now, now go. Okay, this critical a crisis has ended. Okay, and you now have your life. Now go and sin no more. So Jesus was saying to her, basically the same thing that he said to the man that was in the pool of Bethesda. Go and sin no more. If you do, something worse is going to happen to you, and I may not be there to deliver you. Are you listening to me? So there are some things, some situations and some circumstances that you can get yourself in. That's really beyond your control, and it will reach the I reach a critical phase. But what do you do? What do you do? Complaining is not going to get it, get it done. Right. Worrying is not going to get the situation handled. Right. You have to be like David. And I'm going to name the two things that David did, and then I'm going to close. The two things that David did in order to bring him through the crisis that he went through. Number one, he believed in God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And number two, what he said. That is what brought him through the crisis. Number one, just because you believe God, don't keep you from going through crisis. Amen. But because you believe in God, you know that if I'm going to get through the crisis, i got to speak and confess the word of God. Because the Bible said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I'm full of God's word. Yes. I'm full of God's word. I won't say anything else but God's word. I won't say that I'm in a crisis and I'm never coming out of it. I'm in this crisis, not by any fault of mine, but I'm coming out of this crisis. The reason why? Because God is going to deliver me. I've been here before. I'm going to stand my ground. And I know eventually God is going to get me out of this and I'm going to get down the road away and I'm going to look back and say that that was nobody but God. And I have a testimony to tell you that when the 
crisis is over, don't you ever forget about God. And give the Lord a hand. Do you help anybody? 